including and inspiring our new beer recipe kit, Chill Factor Cold IPA. And William's here with food samples. Are you actually videoing this? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, I'm reading <laughs> voiceover stuff that doesn't need to be on camera. Oh, okay. What's going on, everybody? It's Chip Walton here at Northern Brewer Homebrew Supply HQ. You know, it's not often in the world of homebrewing or craft brewing that you get a chance to pick the brain of a brewer credited with developing a new beer style. But recently, I had the chance to do just that. Kevin Davey is the brewmaster at Wayfinder Beer in Portland, Oregon. He's also the person to whom the brewing world attributes the creation of Cold IPA, the popular new subcategory of India Pale Ale that's blown up over the past couple of years, inspiring our new beer recipe kit, Chill Factor Cold IPA. I talked with Kevin as part of our Northern Brewer University Brewing to Style online video series. During the course of our conversation, he shares the origin story of Cold IPA and talks about what he considers the essential elements to the style, including some great tips for home brewers. Kevin also discusses what he calls the false narrative of craft brewing with adjuncts, why Cold IPA is not just an IPL, and what it's like watching the cold IPA style skyrocket in popularity. If you want to go straight to a certain topic, there are timestamps in the video description below. In the video description, you'll also find a link to our Brewing to Style video course where we dissect what cold IPAs are and are not, homebrew two very different versions of the beer, and talk with two more pro brewers about their cold IPA process. And now, our conversation with Kevin Davey. All right, I'm here with Kevin Davey. Kevin, thanks so much for taking some time to talk all things cold IPA. It's kind of, honestly, it's an honor to talk to the person credited with bringing this to the world. You bet. No problem. Um, man, I feel like I've been living, breathing, and definitely drinking all things cold IPA for the better part of a year now. I'm really eager to hear from you just kind of the origin story of this style. What were some of the conversations going on in your brew house and kind of what were you looking to brew that maybe you weren't already experiencing? Um, so cold IPA was kind of uh, brought up after, so when we started Wayfinder, um, we invested heavily in a decoction kettle. We are um, a lager forward brewery. Lager centric is what is the term we always use. So like we're anywhere between 50% to 60% lager beers all the time. If you come into Wayfinder, you can get Pilsner, Helles. Uh, right now we or we've got some Oktoberfest coming up. We've got Vienna Lager. You know, um, I think people that go to Wayfinder and, and like our beers around the Portland area understand this is more of a lager brewery. But we also make IPAs because we're in Portland. And um, cold IPA was kind of bred out of us using that decoction kettle and trying to use it for cereal mashing, exploring that side of craft brewing, or rather, you know, big brewing. Um, which has always fascinated me. And uh, we've made a few American light lagers um, with whole grain um, adjunct, whether it's corn or rice. And after doing that for a while, I, I wanted to see if I could make some, make my own twist on IPA and make it even more American than ever. So it was mainly built on uh, adjunct brewing. There, there was also a little bit of logistical there. And when we talk about being a lager brewery, you know, um, a lot of home brewers probably don't think about this, but we have constantly new Helles and Pilsner coming out. So we always have yeast to harvest from, lager yeast to harvest from. So it was a way of utilizing what we had in house instead of sending it down the drain, making another beer, um, another beer stream with it. Um, so that, that was really important to me too instead of having to buy yeast or go get it from, borrow it from another brewery. And we've kind of, in this course and in other creative projects through Northern Brewer, we've kind of gone over the style guidelines, as it were. Obviously they're not written in stone or BJCP mandated, uh, but I want to know too, in your mind, you know, it's also obvious over the last few years, there's become flexibility, I would say. Uh, in brewing these, but to you, what's essential, what's definitive in your process uh, when doing one of your cold IPAs? Um, so when it comes to style guidelines, I, I'm also a GABF judge and a World Beer Cup judge, and I did rewrite the guidelines in their Brewers Association format, and I have them up on our website. 
So if you go to wayfinder.beer, you can click on cold IPA at the top and read all about it. Okay. But I, and that is <laughs> like, I understand that everybody's going to have their own twist and this style is going to evolve over time. And maybe that, maybe what I think it should be, won't be what it ends up being. And that's, that's fine. But um, I think that the main elements are a high adjunct, high adjunct grist base. Um, fermenting with a lager yeast warm or an ale, excuse me, or an ale yeast cold, although I feel like that's getting a little passe at this point. I think almost everyone's found that just using the lager yeast warm makes more sense. And then um, hopping it pretty aggressively. And, and then I think that the other thing that a lot of people that might change as more people are brewing it is that we've always had this more West Coast alcohol levels, usually about 6.8 and above. And I found that it really shines at about 7% because this beer is incredibly dry. And that's part of the hallmark of this beer is that it's incredibly dry. You have a very high degree of fermentation, uh, much like how Brewed IPA did it, but we were just, we're using adjuncts and American malt instead of using exogenous enzymes um, to get that level of dryness. But when you have that level of dryness, if you don't have a certain amount of alcohol behind it, then um, the beer comes across as too bitter and, too, and not as crisp. It, it, the alcohol adds a sweetness that you actually need there, or else it becomes kind of less palatable. You've mentioned brewed IPA um, a couple of times, and one of my favorite slash least favorite things that people say about cold IPA is it's just an IPL rebranded because <laughs> it wasn't selling. Can you kind of break down why a cold IPA is not uh, an IPL and or a brewed IPA? Kind of what's the advancement with this style? Well, I mean, I guess to be honest, it is a lot of elements of both mashed together and mm -hmm. then also our own twist. The, um, the, the whole, it's just an IPL and I, I, I also feel quite differently about that, mainly because IPLs I, or IPA recipes where they just swap the yeast with lager and didn't really take a lot of thought into other parts of it um, as far as how to dry hop it, how to ferment it, how to lager it. Gold IPA is not lagered and it's fermented warm. It's our fermentation profile is the same as we is the same as we use for Chico and other yeasts. So frankly, if you were to call it a lager, I would be a little offended as a lager brewer. You know, this this beer is not a lager at all. <laughs> sure, it's made with lager yeast, but it doesn't mean it's like if that makes any sense to anybody. Like <laughs> I also think that this beer strays very much far away from a dry hop pilsner and dry hopped pilsner is an interesting thing, but it needs to have a certain level of spice and bitterness and lower alcohol and drinkability and high carbonation. And the dry hopping cannot be as aggressive. And it ends up, if it does, it ends up way too grassy. And if you use more American style hops, it becomes too floral and too fruity. Um, and when I say dry hop pilsner, I think that this is more of something more like Italian pilsner, where there was very light dry hopping using uh, European varieties of hops to get that just a little bit more um, hop swagger or whatever, that Italian showiness that you would, <laughs> you, you would expect from an Italian beer that you might not expect from the more stuffy Germans. Um, Cold IPA is not dry hopped Pilsner either, and it shouldn't be. Um, it should come across very much like an IPA, very much like a West Coast IPA. If you're blindfolded and you drink it and nobody told you it was a lager, there's no, there's, there shouldn't be any flavor in there that says this is a lager beer. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's my big beef with IPL is that IPL comes across like a lager and cold IPA does not. And then as far as brute, it's, it goes into that dryness area, but it doesn't use the enzymes. It's not quite as champagne-y, right? Well, yeah, uh, it, we're not using the high enzymes and we're not using the low to zero bitterness. Um, we're actually doing it. It more represents West Coast IPA and its bitterness regime. Um, the, original, the original ones that we were creating were, um, uh, and if you try original cold IPA from Wayfinder, it is a lot of sea hops, so it's Chinook and Cascade and Centennial. 
Amarillo and Mosaic, but yeah. So there are some new school stuff in there, but it's also very for somebody who's just really used to West Coast beer or West Coast IPA style beers. Um, it's the thinking behind it was more, let's take this West Coast IPA and let's let's make some of the elements of West Coast IPA even more West Coast, even, you know, it's already dry and low caramel. So like, let's take all the caramel out, and let's get it drier. It's already aggressively bitter. Let's make it, let's make that perceptive bitterness even higher from the dryness and the carbonation, stuff like that. Um, it ends up being more crisp and more easy to drink. And um, I, I, if it follows much from Brood IPA is that it also uses adjunct, but I think we use a little bit more adjunct and um, the adjunct is more hidden. It is more uh, part of the main base layer um, in, in, in a way that like American lager, when you drink it, you don't think, oh, this tastes like corn, you know, typically no. It typically doesn't taste just like that adjunct. It is built into the malt grist profile, and um, it adds an element there. But that is from the from the adjunct for cooking adjunct. So yeah, I was going to ask you. A lot of brewers I've talked to here, they're just doing a single infusion mash with X amount of rice or corn, and their pills. Uh, how essential kind of is that decoction? And uh, let's say for like a home brewer that wants to to try this. Um, What's that added benefit from decocting the rice specifically? Well, um, I would say on for flavor profile, if you're if you're using an adjunct, I would say using a whole grain adjunct is best. Using a flaked product is second best, and using a syrup is probably last. You know, and and that's in degrees of utilization of what you get to do as a brewer. Now, if you're a home brewer. You can do whatever you want to. That's the best part about home brewing. You know, it, it might take a longer on your Saturday, but if you're a hobbyist, what does that matter? That's part of the fun, <laughs> you know? Um, it's a lot easier for somebody brewing in their backyard to make a decocted beer than it is on a, on a big system. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you from experience. <laughs> but um, so when you look at, when you look at the, I think that we as brewers have, um, kind of painted a false narrative about adjuncts and a lot of it has to do with um i'll i'll just say the brewers association telling people trying to differentiate craft beer from macro beer and that i think that a lot of the verbiage that was talked about adjunct brewing is that it's cheaper it only makes the beer lighter it's just starch and i would say that all three of those are wrong like for one thing, it's more expensive. Um, <laughs> try to find some rice right now and you'll compare it to your barley prices and you'll find out it's a lot more expensive. Um, the The process is actually hard. It takes, you know, it, it takes some equipment and scientific knowledge and that's just stuff that we love as brewers is actually trying to trying to mold beer out of, out of raw product. And I think that that's really fun. Um, the other thing is that like, this is us trying as craft brewers, taking an American barley product that I feel like should not be used as 100% of your grist load and cutting it with a certain amount of corn or rice. This is a very traditional American way of approaching barley that just frankly doesn't have, or is either too high of protein or um, too much fan, too much other things that really cause stability problems um, down the line and mixing a bit of corn or a bit of rice is a way of balancing it and having it emulate more European style barleys. So when you make these beers, I would suggest not using a European barley, but it was factored around using an American barley. Ours is, um, I, I believe it's mainly Harrington and, Co and Metcalf, although that a lot of that has changed. I think it is now, um, um, I can't think of the name. <laughs> Copeland and Synergy is a lot of the barley varieties that we're getting for these for these beers. Which are Pilsner malts, American Pilsners. You can make them as Pilsner. You can make them as um, pale, you know, but they're they're grown in America. Um, so Pilsner malt is just lighter kilns and germinated in a different way, you know, germinated more slowly, I believe. Um, 
we buy a Pilsner variety, so it's lighter in color. And one of the things that I think is very striking about cold IPA is that since you're using something like a rice syrup corn that is very low color, um, these beers are very, very yellow, even though they're deceptively big. If you were to make them with all malt, it would be more golden. Just based on its original gravity itself, you would have just more density of Pilsner malt, and it would look something like Imperial Pilsner, which I think Imperial Pilsner never really worked very well. So by mixing in that light lager or that light adjunct, it makes it look like it makes it look like a like a Miller Lite or something like that. And then you smell it, you're like, whoa, it's just big and hoppy too. It's, it's kind of a it's a really cool trick, and that's something IPL never really did. So more differentiation. Um, are there any other tips for home brewers from ingredient selection to process that you think? For somebody maybe trying their first or second, um, kind of any tips for us home brewers? Yeah, I think that um, I think that the easiest thing to process is probably going to be corn, and you can just use corn meal if you'd like to, like Bob's Red Meal. We we mainly get just like a yellow non-GMO corn meal. Um, we mix it with a bit of barley and bring it up to a gelatinization rest, which is about 67 degrees Celsius. And then we boil it for 15 minutes while we're doing that. You can do that in a pot. You just have to make sure you're constantly stirring it with a spoon. Um, while you're doing that, mash in your main mash, very thick at, you know, what was 36, so, so like 95 degrees, pretty cold. And then you just mix them together and the enzymes present in that American barley are gonna break down all that corn. And if you look at like the actual breakdown of corn or rice, I think that a lot, like I was mentioning about the narrative of like, it's just starch. It's not, you know, if you look at just cornmeal, you're, go you're going to see um, gums, protein, starch, of course, but um, other things, you know, and, and using a whole grain product or a nearly whole grain product is going to add more mouthfeel and more, and, and more um, flavor, more depth of flavor. Now, rice is a little bit trickier. The gelatinization rest is higher. I think it's about 80 degrees Celsius. And if you don't, and you need to use a lot of water and you need to have this rice uh, milled really fine. So I would suggest rice flour if you're going to use a raw rice product. Um, and then mix in about your total grist load, 10% maybe of the barley crushed up with the decoction. That'll keep it from getting too foamy and um, but when you're boiling rice, it's going to get foamy like in, like crazy anyway. <laughs> the easiest thing to do is just use the flaked product. So you can use like a flaked corn or a flaked rice um, and mash it single infusion. And that'll be a very simple way to make this beer. I would suggest using whole grain adjunct if you can, though. Um, but I, either way, they'll both make very good product. Um, the only thing I would suggest is be very careful with flaked rice. Um, I know a lot of suppliers that we've looked for, that we've tried to source flaked rice from. Um, it doesn't go through the, its whole gelatinization rest in the flaking process. And so however we mashed it, we couldn't get it to um, actually convert. Um, and when we talk about the gelatinization process, there's actually like um, like beta glucans and stuff around the starch granules. And if you don't break them down correctly, you don't access the starch to break down the starch. So we had this one where we were using some flaked rice and we mashed it for hours and hours and it just would not convert. And we ended up going to a local um, gluten-free brewery and borrowing some <laughs> alpha amylase to see if even if we could use, boost a bunch of it. And that still didn't work either. So we ended up dumping the batch. So be careful with rice. Um, I would suggest if you do mash with rice, get a little thing of iodine and check your mash and make sure that you have conversion. Now we do that with every every batch. We're going to make sure that we have conversion, and I would do that as a home brewer, only because you're using you're not using you're not doing it every day, and so maybe a thermometer might be off or something like that. You want to make sure that you get full conversion. If you don't, you're going to have a very cloudy beer at the end of the day because it'll be full of starch. And it'll be sweet and cloudy and sweet is not cold IPA. <laughs> now, what about hops? I mean, is that, it seems like kind of you mentioned sea hops. It, I don't see a lot of people throwing the new, the Sabro and the cashmere. It seems like people are kind of bringing this back to Pacific Northwest old school hops. 
think that's great. <laughs> I think that we should celebrate those things more. Our, the original one that we did, we were just sourcing some really great Chinook and uh, it was kind of forgotten about, but dry hopping with it. And we've always held on, we've always done that, always had Chinook in it. It's a, it's a great hop. Um, we've made a lot of different cold IPAs over the years and we've had some New Zealand versions, ones with Motueka, ones with, New, ones with um, Nelson Sauvin. We have a new one coming out that has a 586 and Cash, Estrada and Simcoe. Um, it's a collaboration with Firestone Walker. I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's going to happen in a couple of weeks. That sounds delicious. Um, but yeah, I think that, yeah, having a more classic approach to West Coast IPA, you know, you can't go wrong with Simcoe and Centennial. And then one thing I like about cold IPA, I feel like it's really, it's broken some barriers. It's busted some myths. It's really kind of opened people's understanding to, in particular, fermenting lager, yeast, warm, this thing we were told. So from the beginning of your interest in homebrewing not to do, can you just talk a little bit about uh, how that works? What, uh, not how it works so much, that's more scientific probably, but like really what is kind of the end result um, of fermenting a lager warm and kind of some strange suggestions that you think people uh, should give this a try with? Um, yeah, so, I think that your more <laughs> finicky lager strains, I would not use this, I would not try this technique. So um, I got to think of which ones that would be on the homebrew level. Probably not on dex yeast. The, I don't know which one the on dex yeast is now that I think about it. Uh, we've always just used 3470, which um, if you get it from Imperial, it's probably the closest one is global. Um, from, I'm not sure the White Labs number, but Y-East is 2124. Um, it's that big industrious one. It, it's kind of bulletproof. You can kind of brew with it however you want to. And it kind of always does a very similar thing. The, the thing about um, a couple of considerations, you don't want to pitch it the way that you would a, a lager, only because it's you don't want to over pitch it. You're going to have more cell growth at the warmer temperature and the higher gravity. So if you pitch too much, you're going to have a lot of more um, over pitch flavors, which is some some autolysis, maybe some sulfur, maybe some other things. Um, you do want this yeast to actually ferment, and it'll ferment fine at 60 degrees. Um, it's interesting. We think of lager as fermenting cold and ales as for getting, getting warm, but you have to remember that yeast ferments warm. Lager is just a mutant that can ferment cold. So when we're growing lager yeast in labs, we're not doing it at 45 degrees, you know. Um, it, it is a, a healthy fermentation at 65. That being said, you know, since it's higher gravity and it was warmer fermented, we typically don't harvest our yeast from our IPAs. Right, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's just kind of, it's cool when a style like this comes along in my mind that really it teaches you a new thing about our four ingredients or our four classic ingredients that people just, you know, will die on the hill saying one thing. <laughs> and then all of a sudden this, this thing comes along like, oh my gosh, like what other styles could that apply to? And that's, that's so cool. Where are the people, where are the people yelling heretic for pastry stout, you know? It, it, like all of a sudden like cold IPA is the bad thing because we just made beer the way people have always made beer. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think that there's a little bit of nuance in cold IPA that's different than everybody else. But um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of these newer styles of beer that I frankly don't really want beer to be associated with. And I hate to be a get on my high horse about it. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that making beers as sweet as we have been making them as craft brewers and um, with as many adjuncts as people are using these days, I just... I think that's further away from beer than anything cold idea could do. I uh, just want to ask real quick, just kind of as a person in the in the brewery, you know, your your brew staff as well, like credited with this style, you know, going on, I guess, kind of you could say four or five years ago, but now in this last year, just blowing up all across the country, kind of what's that feel like uh, for you to see and, you know, kind of 
Do you get a lot of uh, tribute from brewers sending you their <laughs> cold IPAs? It, yeah, actually, a lot of people have sent us cold IPA and reached out. Um, I think that's really cool. I mean, at first, it kind of like was a couple of people that had come into Wayfinder and tried it and were like, oh, we want to try to make something like this. And then that kind of just snowballed, you know, somebody else tried it, did a good version of it, and somebody tried it over there and was like, well, I want to do that too, you know, or, you know, with the internet age, things just go really, really fast. But Craft Brewers Conference was in Minneapolis this year, and I went out there and it, I felt like every brewery I went to had a cold IPA. I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so cool. More, I mean, if it's fun and people like it, I think that that's all that really matters. Cool. All right, Kevin, I'll let you get back to the brew house or whatever onslaught of meetings you might have today. Thanks for taking some time to school us on cold IPA, how we can make them better at home and just how to better enjoy them. And how also I like bulletproof, bulletproof yeast. Thanks for telling us about <laughs> bulletproof yeast. Well, it's kind of funny. Uh, I remember uh, my first, the first brewer that I learned from Will Kemper, he would call it industrious yeast. It was very industrious. And really that meant that like, man, it just always did what it was gonna do. <laughs> Some yeast are just really, really well adapted to making beer. And 34 is, is the most used lager yeast in the world for a reason. It's very good at making beer. Cool. All right. Well, here, cheers. Early morning cheers. No beers. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Appreciate you. All right. Thanks for having me and happy brewing. Hope your beers come out good. I want to give a shout out and some real big thanks to Wayfinder Beer and specifically Kevin Davey for taking the time to talk all things cold IPA with us. Remember, this conversation is an excerpt from our Brewing to Style video course series as part of our Northern Brewer University video course catalog. We would love for you to take part in the full course. You can see the class link in the video description below or check out northernbrewer.com university.